Imagine citizens working with the government to develop technology that makes their community a more joyous and equitable place to live. New Mexicans are exploring the promise of the civic tech movement, most recently at the DataFest ArtQuest, sponsored by the City of Albuquerque and the New Mexico Foundation for Open Government. Welcome to Augmented Humanity. Our guests are modern explorers working at the intersection of technology and the humanities. They help us to understand ourselves and the worlds we create in this digital age. They are thinkers, creators, makers, and academics, working in diverse fields like linguistics, technology, game and object design, and ethics. I'm your host, Craig Goldsmith. I'm your host, Ellen Dornan. On this program, we're talking with Eric Renz Whitmore, a lead organizer of the DataFest ArtQuest event, and Karen Mazur, Public Art Project Coordinator and Database Administrator for the City of Albuquerque Public Art Program. Thank you both so much for joining us today. This is really exciting. It sounds like you all just wrapped up a really fantastic event. And I guess I want to start by asking, how did this end up being an open government event with the Public Art Department? Our collection database was a little behind. It had not been updated in a long time. The system that holds it was down for a long time. And I remember Sherry saying that the IT department or DTI at the city was, we were in their good graces and they decided to choose us to do this project with. <laughs> so Because you cleaned up your data? Or because, I don't know, we needed to clean it up or we had done them some solids recently, who knows? but we were the chosen ones. We had recently done a big project of uploading to the public data site all of the meeting minutes for the Albuquerque Arts Board. And so that was a project we did last summer, and I guess we were just kind of in the open data loop. Maybe that's kind of how it came about. And I think, I mean, an additional element that came out uh, over the weekend is New Mexico Foundation for Open Government, I think, had been talking with both the city clerk's office and with Department of Technology and Innovation around doing something. And I want to say that they received some grant to do an open government activity. So I think they were looking for what that might be. And I know uh, the deputy director of, uh, of DTI, Mark Leach, he knows that I, I kind of like getting into these sort of innovative kinds of events. And he'd also spoken to an organization that I kind of head up, Code for Albuquerque. So he knew that we were looking for projects to work on. And I guess when this conversation started, I guess I was one of the early people that he contacted saying, would you be interested in kind of talking with some people for a couple of months? <laughs> I'm working on an event. Yeah. So it was sort of a serendipitous intersection of interests. Do you mind describing the event a little bit? Because it took place over some period of time, right? I'll sort of hone in on the hackathon piece because it really is sort of a multifaceted kind of event. And I'll say just to kind of help frame it, in some ways it was a bit of an experiment. You know, so most of us hadn't necessarily done, say, a hackathon before. Not that this was very large, but none of us had done a really public facing event, inviting the public into a common space in, you know, 16, 18 months. So the idea of doing something that had an in-person component, maybe had something online, you know, how do we encourage innovation in hackathons, but how do we also promote some of the ideas around open government and what public art actually is? So it had a, a lot of different facets. The part that I was probably most involved with myself was around hackathons. And I've run sort of a couple of smallish hackathons in the Albuquerque area over the years. But really, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think there's been one in at least a few years. So this is an opportunity to bring some of that together, also leverage maybe some other experiences I'd had recently to do that. So just general hackathon kind of setup. Basically, what we created was a sufficient framework for folks to get involved and be able to talk about potential projects, then be able to work on those projects and have some kind of culminating event. And we created a pretty minimal platform in order to be able to do that, partially because we weren't sure who was going to be able to come in the door. So we knew we wanted to provide that information so people were grounded in the actual needs and what the actual uh, sort of resources and capabilities were. I want to say what that mostly did was it started some really fruitful conversations, not only about building a few different sort of apps and experiences, but also, I think, helping drive the conversation forward about what needs to be public, particularly in the public art realm, and some of the other there are maybe considerations around that. For someone that doesn't know what a hackathon is in a general sense, what's a hackathon? What's the elevator pitch for a hackathon? 
The super bare bones version is you invite a number of people, ideally to me uh, with complementary skill sets together to solve a problem, to address a problem or find a solution to a challenge. You know, there can be tens of thousands of dollars on the line, or it can be, you know, you get your photo in a paper and you get some applause. It's a wide range of what kind of the outcomes can be. But typically, sometimes people come with their own team. Sometimes people are going to build something themselves. We create an environment where people can come together and work on things together. And then over the course of time, sometimes this is a day, sometimes it's a weekend, sometimes it's something longer. What we choose to do for this was we knew people or we thought people needed to spend some time maybe thinking through this. We launched it on Saturday, June 12th, and then we had another hackathon, another event day that was on the 19th so that people would have an opportunity through the course of the week to continue to develop and test what they build. Then conclusion of a hackathon in general, there's some kind of a culminating event where people share what it is that they've been working on and what they've gotten to. Sometimes you've got people who've built companies or they've built great apps or something. Sometimes it's really more of like almost the scope of a project. I want to do this so that something can be achieved. And sometimes that's sufficient. So going into this, we didn't know who we were going to get. (laughs) We were really, really open to anything along that range. But at the end of the day, ideally, there were conversations and relationships developed. And then also at least a few different outcomes that we can share with the wider public. The people that are going to come to a hackathon that are going to participate are going to be coders, database people. I think that's the typical hackathon. And the thing that I don't like about that is it scares people away. So yes, we need people with technical talent. But what I've seen, and there's been sort of a pushback depending on who you talk to and who you look at around the country, a lot of people don't like hackathons partially because you get some really tech involved folks who are brilliant, but there's not that opportunity to involve like the end user or to involve the subject matter expert who's played with this for years. They know the ins and outs of it, but you never got around to making that phone call on Saturday or they were out with their family and you couldn't get what you needed. So you built a thing and it dies. You know, you built something cool. It's Sunday afternoon. Maybe you got a prize, but nobody ever uses it and it never moves forward. So one of the things we tried to do as as an organizing team was how do we make sure that people get grounded in the information they need, have access to different kinds of people and talents so that when we do build something, it's more useful and has the more potential to do what we really wanted to do at the end of the day, which is encourage people to experience public art. I want to get back to that in a second, but I just want to ask you about something that you said, just to clarify, when you're talking about needs and you're talking about resources, these are the city of Albuquerque public art, the resources are the data, and the needs for the public or needs for the public art department, who was sort of goal setting for these participants? I think that from the public art perspective, we had no idea what would happen. In a way, this was an impetus for us to get in there and make sure our data set was something that could be released to the public. So that alone was a kind of deadline driven, like, oh my gosh, we've been needing to do this. We were so ill-informed about what this event would be that I think even at the beginning, maybe our program manager, Sherry Brueggemann and us, we might have even been thinking, oh, people can help us, you know, like a wiki-a-thon type of thing. Like, oh, maybe this will be a thing where people can help us collect our own data or, you know, help us enter the data. Because we could have had an a-thon just getting our inventory and our collection buttoned up. So that's kind of where we were coming from. And we've been wondering for a while, sort of what will we do with this data once we have our database all sort of cleaned up? We've been thinking a lot about things like little apps that where people could create their own public art tour, or somebody had the idea of a visual timeline of the history of the public art collection. Like how is this 1% for the art money been spent over time? How many different kinds of people does it go to? Where do those people live? All that kind of information. So we just had no idea. It just got us thinking about this collection data and what could we learn from it. It's kind of a weird detail question maybe, but as far as the data itself, When you say the collection, is there public art that's in storage that isn't actually out? Or is the collection what we think of as installed public art throughout the city? Technically, yes, what you just said. (laughs) We have a large portable collection of 2D works and things like that. So 
things get stored temporarily or have to be moved around. We don't officially collect in that way. Like we don't have a storage place. We don't have proper ventilation somewhere where we can keep works. Public art is all about being displayed in the public. And so that's one of the things about it that makes it unique from say the museum art collection. About how many pieces are we talking about? It's another interesting thing is, okay, we have about 1,300 pieces in our collection, but each project number is a project. So it may not have resulted in an object like we know it. It may have been a temporary art project. And then what results as a piece of our collection is documentation from that temporary art project. So that's the way we sort of get around doing temporary work. I was thinking this whole time that there would be location data as part of the data that you had. And I guess that would be the case for some of the collection, but not all. Well, there is location data for it. But, you know, if you look at the interactive map, there's going to be like a thousand circles around City Hall or the convention center. We have a lot of works placed in those locations on the walls. We have location data for all of our collection technically. Some of it though isn't exactly accurate. The latitude and longitude might be based on like a street corner near a park, but it may not actually be that exact object inside the park. So in an ideal world, we could have deployed lots of people to go out and geocode artwork with their iPhones and give us that exact location. So did you need to give participants sort of an orientation to the data at the beginning of the hackathon? Or did you just like throw it at them? You say, here's your spreadsheet, go nuts, right? <laughs> Little of both. <laughs> Little of both, you know, and that's going back on it. That's something that I think we touched on it at a couple different points. Like there was a lot that I learned about the public art collection. The idea that public art moves was not something that had been in my head. And I should have seen it because I'd seen some of the spreadsheets with that data. It was not something that my brain kept. <laughs> And one of the things we'll end up doing is thinking about, assuming that we do something like this in the future, some of the lessons learned from this are, yeah, we totally should have done like a deep dive or at least, you know, half an hour or so looking at, here's what the data set looks like. Here's what these fields mean. Maybe here's a little bit of history of why those exist. We didn't really do that. So yeah, that's something that we're still learning. It's funny how you bring up about even just starting to look at data on real objects can make you think about what those objects really are and how they're used, like what you said, Karen. In a way, it makes me feel kind of naive. I don't think of paintings on the wall of a public building as public art, but they are public art. When I think public art, I think sculptures out in front of the Civic Plaza. I think of outdoor public art. But I guess anything that's city-owned property, if you're displaying it on the walls, then it's public art. Or the libraries, does the libraries count? Yep. And if it's paid for with this 1% for the arts money, then it's definitely public art. Yeah. And in that sense, the citizens of the city own the art. Exactly. Yep. Now that we've been through the whole event, I understand it now. <laughs> So I'm ready for round two. I'm ready for version two, where we really, really try to drive that point home that this art collection belongs to the citizens of Albuquerque. They have access to it. They have access to even the 1% money because all the calls for artists are open to anybody. They can join the arts board. They can help make decisions about what art gets put out there. So great opportunity. This data is currently available, correct? We could actually go look at it. Yes, it's on the City of Albuquerque open data site. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute.
Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. We've talked about the hackathon and sort of how you went in and what the people were doing there. But I wanted to back up just a little bit and talk about open government and how this came to be a citizen initiative in partnership with government. What is open government about and how does it impact us as citizens? So I'll say we had a really good session on the 19th uh, with Tom Johnson, who works with the New Mexico Foundation for Open Government. And he talked a little bit about open government, but how that relates to some other concepts we typically work with. He did a really good job of describing that was new to me was the difference between transparency and actual open government. First of all, the bottom line is that it's the public's data. The information that's created through all these different means that we've paid through with our taxes, that is something that the government in a way maintains for us. Now, one thing that folks really look for is that information transparent. In other words, can you look at it? Can we see the minutes of this meeting? Can we see these other kinds of things? But the thing that we really aspire to do a better job of is this more open government ideal, which is that the data and information that goes into government is provided back in a way where people can actually use it. So it's not just, say, a picture or even a PDF sometimes of an agenda, but it's really, you know, who all was involved, spreadsheets about who was involved at what time, how did money flow, things like that. That all kind of goes into that open government picture and the fact that it can be used by a lot of different people. And we don't always know, as came out through this hackathon or through this event, we don't always know what they're going to use that information for. And they don't always know what they're going to use it for. Sometimes in working with it, the data story emerges from it. I kind of describe it as still an aspiration for how government shares the information that it has with the wider public in a thoughtful way. Because I do think it's useful to mention that there are things that the government probably shouldn't share to protect the rights of individuals. So they do have a job that may need to control or may need to moderate the kinds of information that are available. But ideally, that happens as part of a public discussion, where it's not just somebody in government says you can't have it and there's no recourse. Instead of that, how can we have a wider, thoughtful discussion about what can be provided so that the people can make the most use of information that is available? To me, there are some things that are kind of no-brainers. Like, So, for example, we're talking about money that is collected via tax mechanism and then is spent on public art owned by the citizens of Albuquerque. So to be able to track that money, to be able to track, say, how the decisions are made by the board and what projects get funded is kind of a no-brainer. But when you say that there are some things potentially that should remain private, do you have like a concrete example in mind? And I realize what you're saying that should come as also as a discussion, right? Because government should be open and transparent. But what would be an example of something that should be kept more private? One example that was mentioned, and I thought it was a good one, is sort of victims' rights. So if we're tracking crime data, there is on some piece of paper or in some data file, there's the person who was injured in some way, you know, whether that's a car accident or something else. And because they were injured by that doesn't necessarily mean that their name and their home address and their phone number and social security number should be made available to absolutely everyone. So how do we protect, how do we balance that person's rights as an individual with the fact that they interacted with city government or municipal government in some way? It's not always that we should make that all available. So how do we make sure that we're balancing those different needs? Even from the public art perspective, where we have part of our database is every constituent or every person who made art, every artist, everyone who made a donation, and we're not going to release all their addresses and phone numbers, for instance, as part of the open data. Karen, I know that you can't speak for the entire city of Albuquerque here, but is it your sense from within the public art department that the city is moving more towards open data? It sounds like you were being encouraged by the DTI. The Department of Technology and Innovation, right? This is the good old IT department. You know, we've had a lot of IPRA requests this past year, I'll say. And so the more this information is available, the better. So that was part of the impetus for getting all those arts board notes digitized and up on this website a year ago. And so, yeah, it just pays to have it available because when people make an IPRA request about the public art program, we have to find every bit of information they're asking for. So helps to have it all handy. IPRA is Inspection of Public Records Act. It's our local version of a Freedom of Information Act request. 
if you have better data, it also just makes it easier to fulfill those requests without it taking huge amounts of time on the staff side and whatnot. Or hopefully people can get it without even having to contact you. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> even better. <laughs> That's something that came up in the discussions uh, and kind of the public talks over the weekend. And I will say Albuquerque has been among the leaders in open government in many years. And we may not always get how important that is, but it's one of the earlier cities that was making that data available. One of the things that I think helps city government is when people in the public are making requests. We help city government prioritize what they make available more quickly. So making absolutely everything available might be the goal, but having some sense of priority and what's easier and what's most needed to make that available first is useful. So to some degree, sometimes these IPRA requests, if you're getting a lot of these, that says, well, you know, rather than do each of these as an individual release, maybe that's a data set that we want to look at opening up a little bit more. So it's useful. It's the citizen's voice. Were there some priorities like that that came out of the hackathon and the Data Fest event? You know, aside from the public art stuff, which obviously was the focus of it. I think something that's still sort of discussion is there's information that's available, but it's not always available in the most useful format. The data that's available around public art is better, say, than just having a PDF. And I don't know, I'm, I don't mean to slam PDFs, but the information is available is better than that. However, until you have more interactions with, say, the tech folks, and also those end users, until you have those kinds of conversations, that really helps us learn, well, if we captured the data in this way, we made it available in this format, that's really going to be of greater benefit to the wider community. So it's really not just that the data is available, but is it available in the most useful way? And oftentimes it's a journey. So I think one of the things that this couple of weekends allowed us to do was, oh, if we made it available a little bit more like this, that would help us do what we want to do. Were people able to take your data and do something with it? What did people want to do when they got your awesome spreadsheet? There were a lot of people who were interested in sort of planning bicycle routes or walking trips and creating sort of individualized maps. That was something I noticed that came up right away. So I think there was a couple different levels, but to your point, Ellen, what was built? So we're still getting some of the feedback from people who were building projects. So I don't necessarily know all of those. The pieces that I saw most were around this discovery of public art and sharing it. Several of us talked about different versions of like a scavenger hunt or route planning. There was one person, I think maybe working with another person or two, who was working on how to make that a little bit easier. So say I know I'm traveling to Old Town and I want to find public art that's along the way. That's a complex problem. So there was a lot of work that he was putting into that. The thing that I kind of focused on was more of the scavenger hunt. How do we suggest a set of public art that we're interested in getting people to visit, then have them go there, prove that they were there with a photo, and then you know sort of report back on social media? So we had a couple of people that did that. In addition to that, and I haven't played with it yet, but there was uh, somebody who was a part of the group that found a scavenger hunt app online that allows local people to create their own experiences. If you take the trail of the scavenger hunt and you take images and you prove that you were there, you get coins. It's like a gamified kind of version. So those are a couple of things that people have actually done as a result of this over the course of the past you know, week and week and a half. Were there any suggestions about applications or processes that would work the other way, which is to feed back into the data set itself and correct it? I know, Karen, you had said that in some cases you have geolocation data for public installations, but they're not actually where the piece itself is. And I'm just thinking out loud, like I have my phone and I post the geotagged photo of the piece currently. Was there any discussion of ways to correct the data or even do things like provide current photos of the state of the pieces? I presume, Karen, you don't have armies of people that can go around to all the public art and see if they're getting damaged or need restoration or whatever. Was there any discussion of stuff like that? Well, yes. And Eric even created a very helpful tool for anyone who wanted to do that. I don't know if you want to speak to that, Eric, but it allowed people to go out into the field and report back on the pieces that they found. I'm not a coder myself, or I haven't coded in this century. <laughs> I'll put it that way. <laughs> so wait a second, maybe, maybe it was 2004. So I may, I may have passed the cutoff, but it's been quite a long time. 
So I've been experimenting with using what are called no-code tools in order to help people kind of build projects and do a lot of things online without the benefit of coding. So I built something that was, I, I think it's, it's pretty good. It's not quite where I want to bring it yet. You know, I'm not sure if we'll have an updated link by the time that this show posts. Basically, we were asking, what are people's sort of impressions of the location? You know, is there some kind of feedback that we wanted to get? So that was like providing an opportunity for more general feedback. In addition to that, in discussion with the public art team, a couple of the things that we were looking at are, what are the other hashtags? What are the other variables that we want people to suggest? One thing that came up that frankly had completely passed my mind, completely over my head was that indoor outdoor piece. Some pieces are behind either a wall that might be closed at a certain hour, or they're in a place where you have to pay for access, whether that's the zoo or it's the biopark. So some of the pieces are behind some kind of wall. Knowing that is a good thing if you're going to plan an outing that you know where those things are. So that's a descriptor that I don't think has been in the database. And as a result of this, might actually get into the official city database. I want to say also, as Karen mentioned earlier, one of the things that an event like this does is it prompts the teams to kind of tidy up their place. <laughs> you know, let's make sure everything's shiny and people can come in that it's welcoming. So there was a lot of work happening behind the scenes in the museum system that is used to track the public art. So cleaning up some of the data, making sure that it was available, identifying some of the gaps, but also I think getting ready for people to input. So there's kind of a public route where people can update that is available to the public, but there's also a behind the scenes that gets immediately into the public art system. You know what? I didn't even think about public art that could be behind a paywall in a sense, like at the zoo or the botanical gardens. It actually never even occurred to me. If you don't pay the admission, you can't necessarily see that art. So tracking that seems crucial, especially because we paid for it. I think we could gain from a tool like what Eric created, too, is sort of more qualitative information about public art. And I think that's what he was getting at with tags. Our program manager, Sherry, got hooked on this idea of, and this is a little bit like the gamifying public art routes, but to create this sort of experience generator. And this is a thing that exists, but just for public art where, you know, maybe you type in like, I'm looking to see all things that are red or all things made of bronze, or I wanna see all the monuments that depict conquistadors or whatever. There aren't really many of those up anymore, but you get the idea. Just as much sort of anecdotal data as we could collect on them would be great. And part of this is wanting to know what the public thinks about public art and that they're experiencing it at all, because we are in a funny place in our culture with public art. People have feelings about it and we need to respond to that somehow. And so the more we know what people want and want to see, the better for everybody. And having that data you can actually look at and leverage is a big step towards that. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. This is just so much fun talking with you all. I do want to ask about the soft outcome. So it sounds like you had participation in this event, some enthusiastic institutional support, and you got some products out of it. But on your website, one of the things that it talks about as a goal for the event is fostering engagement with public art. And I know it's a little too soon to understand what the impact looks like, but how are you measuring that? We've had all these aha moments this morning of talking 
talking about public art and sort of having new ideas about what it is or where it is. So did any of those moments happen or was any of that translated? So I've worked outside city government. I've worked in city government. I actually was part of DTI for a time. And one of the things that before I worked for city government and I got the open government civic tech bug and Gov 2.0 and all that kind of stuff was like, gosh darn it, we should have all this stuff available and it should be available now. (laughs) Right? And felt pretty passionate about it. The thing that I think I believe has helped me over time is the conversation over time around how that becomes available. And one of the things that your question gets to is what's the capacity? of city government and other organizations to support whatever. Because if we came up with five fantastic million dollar ideas, I don't know that Karen's got five million dollars in her pocket (laughs) to spend on making sure that those ideas happen. And one of the things in terms of doing these kind of like scavenger hunt kind of activities, so I'll use that as an example. We're still working through it, and I'm hopeful that we'll actually turn this into something that reappears as far as encouraging public art. But one of the things that I hadn't known about until the event was that the public arts program has these trading cards for public art around town. And I'd been looking for a hook. How do we get people to really engage with public art? And we have a map kind of app and we have this other thing that we were going to use, but that's not as friendly as showing somebody a card and say, go out, find this, take a photo and share it. And that's a fairly low level kind of activity, but we're also working with offices that are just opening up right now. I don't know how many cards they have on hand. There's a lot of these little operational kinds of things that are necessary, even on a fairly small activity that need to be worked out. So I recognize that it's not always easy to say, yes, go out and do all these great things. There's a conversation that needs to happen around how that gets supported. Like, is that an hour a week for Karen? Is that more important than the other thing she was doing with that hour a week? And those are some of the decisions that activities like this prompt. Something that seems like a no brainer when it's looked at through a city government lens and how they need to support this. If they can make a promise to support a thing, they could be supporting that for five, 10 years. When they make that decision, how do they make that? You're saying it's not just about the immediate engagement through this activity or immediate engagement through these million dollar apps that everybody developed that are very cool, but it's really looking at what are the ways that people want to engage. I think, Karen, you mentioned that people are really into having the public art be part of their adventure how you can adjust your work to be more responsive over the long term to keep building it. That's really cool that the hackathon itself is part of a feedback process. (laughs) Yes. I think getting people engaged with public art and knowing that it belongs to them, I think would go a long way toward people understanding what the program does and what it could mean for them. Because public art is a funny thing where it's kind of like good book design. It can be kind of invisible if it's doing what it does. But when people don't like what they see, that's when they want to get engaged. But whatever way we can get people engaged is good. You know, if they get engaged because they don't like what they see, then I want to know what they'd rather rather see. As a program, we should want to know that. Getting more public feedback about what's out there in general would be really great. Was there any discussion at the event or as part of you cleaning up some of the data about the public art, like reviews? And I know that's like a can of worms with public art. I presume the goal isn't always just to put out crowd pleasers, or maybe it is. That is a can of worms there because there's a public process and depending on who is part of that process for any given project, we could think the outcome's going to go one direction and it could be a totally different direction and we have no control over it. The administrators of this 1% money don't choose any of the work that goes out there technically. We're just facilitating that public art process with the Arts Board, City Council and the Mayor's Office. So driving engagement actually has really tangible outcomes for the program itself. Absolutely. Because the more people who are engaged with public art program, the more influence a broader section of the public can bring to bear on the selection of the art that you purchase. Absolutely. Yep. It is a public process. I mean, it's 100% a public process. You know, anyone can come to the arts board meetings. 
I thought you just wanted everybody to be happy. Right? <laughs> Go out and see some art. But you're really driving civic engagement. So that was one of my questions is how does it drive having a more equitable community? But it sounds like just having more people who can have a say in how their funds are spent may result in a more equitable process ultimately. Yep, absolutely. That's the only way I think it'll result in a more equitable process. Because, you know, we can say the calls are all open, anybody can apply, but not everybody even knows those applications exist, or they don't know about that call for art. And we need to get people plugged in 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 a variety of different ways, not just the people who sort of look for open art calls, or who happen to know about the public art process. It might be a little a field, but you both in that little interchange said something about the program being equitable. What do we really mean by that? What does equity look like in this context? There's some ways you can look at equity that wouldn't be affected, say, by the DataFest ArtQuest. For instance, you know, what kinds of artists are represented in our collection? Nobody's ever collected demographic information. We don't really have those numbers. We can't say, oh, look how diverse our collection is. But what we can change is who has access, I guess. That's where I think we can push that equity piece is who has access to this process. That's the only way we're going to get a more diverse collection that represents all of this city. And by access to the process, you don't just mean seeing the art, you mean submitting work for selection or being on the arts board, perhaps, or whatever. Yes, yes, exactly. Being sort of part of the decision-making process. What you said earlier about when it's working, it's invisible, I thought was really crucial because when you have a lot of public art, which I think we do in Albuquerque, I mean, everywhere you go, there's something, it seems like. It's the kind of thing where you wouldn't notice always unless it just all vaporized overnight. And then you'd be like, why is every street corner so ugly? Or at least empty. Eric, I wanted to ask this of you because you used the term earlier and it was also in one of the wrap-up emails from the hackathon. What is a data story and how does that play into the work you're doing here? That's a great question. Now I'll try to remember why that came up. I thought somebody else either mentioned it during one of the sessions on our first Saturday or it's something that I've heard in and around the the sort of public interest technology world. And that is that, you know, one of the reasons to make that public is that different people can make different stories from it. So the story of how and where public art may have started and may have moved around town, that's a story. The people who have been chosen to create works of art, but also the people who experience it. Each of those is a different story that reflects a little bit on this whole public art arena, let's say. Our ability, both from, say, the public sector or from city or from wherever, our ability to tell a different story is key to getting people to experience it in different ways. There may be community groups that haven't felt like they should or need to be involved with the process around becoming part of this commission. They may not have thought that. However, if the information is presented in a way that says, you know, your neighborhood needs to tell its story. If it's presented in that way, there are going to be people around town who I'm sure are going to say, yeah, we want to be involved in this process. You know, we don't have something that really reflects what we think about our neighborhood. That's something that can be super, super powerful. And it's similar with all sorts of different dimensions on this. So I think as we seek to increase engagement with this, thinking of the kinds of stories we want to tell. Is it equitable? Are we telling the stories of this or that? The more that we think about that, the better we can engage these different segments of our wider community. Even the ways, the stories it can tell us, right? So if we have all the data visualized, we can see, oh, there has not been a commission in this city council district in 25 years. Why is that? Oh, there hasn't been an arts board member from that district either. Why is that? You know, we can kind of start to put together that story of where we are now. Did you see any of that emerge directly from the event? I haven't yet seen it emerge from the event, but it certainly came up through all of the work we were doing to populate our database and get our collection information up to date. We had one of our staff members who spent a lot of time entering all the different dates that go into each commission. You know, the date that the Arts Board approved this project, the date that the money was let loose, the date that the commission started, the date it finally ended those kinds of stories we can look at and see how the process moves. 
It's really interesting. I actually hadn't thought about that, that without all that data, you wouldn't even have a way of saying how long on average is the process for picking and selecting the art and actually getting it out there, which could be helpful even for the artist. Or you could even do a tour of the most expensive pieces of public art. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) Yep. Yep. (laughs) On that note, Sherry Brueggemann, our program manager, she had this idea that she wanted to calculate how many dollars per square inch of murals we have. So she started adding up how much each commission was, how big is this mural? And she wants to sort of get that data story. And part of that is from fielding questions from, I guess there's a persistent constituent who has been asking about the mural process. Like I've applied for murals. Why haven't I gotten a mural commission? Or I've noticed that this anomaly or that anomaly. And so she wants to have that information ready so she can say, well, here's the deal. This is the story of our murals and it's all right there for you. You call it a commission, the people that actually pick the art, or that's the arts board? We commission the artists to to create the work, yes. But the board selects the artist in the work. And it could almost be interesting to see how the different members of the board voted. Oh, absolutely, yes. And what art results from that, especially because we were talking about equity. You know, if you have a bunch of people from one part of town, they may, for whatever reason, tend to choose certain kinds of art. And this would be an interesting way to almost track that process. Right. We have an arts board member from each city council district and then two at-large members. But even if they're scattered throughout the city, there's so many other variables, you know, their age, their experience with art, just so many different variables. Yes. The makeup of the arts board makes a big difference as to what art gets commissioned. Being able to track it could just be so useful and not even necessarily to do gotchas, but just to work the other way, like verify that there is a fair process or what people might think of as a fair process. Yeah, or isn't. Our arts board now is going through our whole policy and the law and everything to sort of update it. They're picking it apart one little bit of policy at a time and trying to figure out where we are and if it's serving the city the way it should be. Is that because of some of the controversies around public art and monuments and whatnot over the last year? It's a little bit of that and just that need to sort of be transparent and accountable and to make that effort, yes. I'm sort of curious because certainly individuals are going to come at government and say, why isn't government working for me? But it sounds like as a group, the people in your event wanted to make government work for them in a very individual way. They were really concerned about telling a data story that involves them as a viewer or an adventurer or a treasure hunter or something like that. And you really didn't come out of that event with, you know, like, let's make government more functional or let's make the appropriation process more equitable or whatever. The first data story, if I'm getting this right, the first data story everybody wanted to tell is, here's how I go out and have fun with the amazing public art of Albuquerque. Yeah. And if we zoom out a little, that tells a story about the time we're in, right? I mean, this was the first event most people have gone to and the first time we've engaged in public with people face to face. So maybe it just says, yeah, people wanted to go out and have a little fun or be prepared for the next time there's a lockdown and know that they have something to do outdoors. (laughs) Well, hopefully we won't have to do that again. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. 
Eric, Karen, before we get into some of the real nitty gritty details about what some of this data might look like and some of what you were doing with it during the data fest, I would like to ask each of you, if you can and you're willing, how did you actually come to be doing this work that you are doing? I don't necessarily think you went to school to get a degree in database administration for the public arts program. And Eric, I don't think you went to DataQuest Academy, but maybe you did. <laughs> um, so what brought you to this current place and time to be doing this kind of work? It's been a circuitous path for sure. I have a background in visual arts and graphic design, photography, and as an art educator. And I've always been interested in public art from the kind of civic engagement community-driven public art kind of standpoint. I mean, I like to look at a big site-specific sculpture if it's interesting, but also just the idea of art made with the public in mind that's accessible to people who don't go to museums or some way for people to engage in visual arts that's available. I went to UNM to get a master's in art education, and I've got a fellowship working at the Center for Southwest Research to inventory the public art at UNM campus, which oddly enough, and this says a lot about public art, there was no central collection mechanism for them at all. It's more like folklore, how this thing got on the campus. There were a lot of pieces that are actually part of the city's public art program that people at UNM weren't even 100% clear on. There's a lot of pieces from the state's Art in Public Places program that get placed there. So I did a real simple sort of digital humanities version of that where I was just photographing and writing metadata on public art that I could see on main campus and then uploading it to the New Mexico digital platform. And so there's about 150 pieces available with photograph up there now. I inventoried a lot of other works, but I just wasn't able to document a lot of them get a good photograph or even get information about who was the artist or when it showed up so when i was done with school this job at the public art program came up and i think their collection database had been down for a number of months and so i think they just were like oh you 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 can do something like this so it was a good six months or so before the museum system database came back online and we were able to access it. And of course, by then we were all working from home. So it's been a real slow process and the hackathon event kind of gave us an opportunity to just focus on that for a while. I had an intern from UNM and a contract employee. We were all working on this almost full time there for a few months, you know, just finding information from different places and trying to get things clean and clear in that database. So that's how I landed here. And what about you, Eric? How did you end up at this time in this place? I've been involved since I moved to Albuquerque, what, 25 plus years ago, involved in and around creative technology, usually with some aspect of economic development. And as I was looking at how do we build our capacity or capabilities around that, I started seeing some of the innovation, the team innovation events that were taking place around the country and started looking at how do we implement those. And one of the things that I discovered is that really, if you're looking for a thriving city that does whatever, business, technology, the arts, if you're looking for a city that does that well, they engage to some degree in this sort of public problem solving process where people are coming together to make good things happen. And it's not just say the city or it's not just this other entity in town, but it really is this community coming together around that. Since kind of realizing that several years ago, I got more involved in say hackathons or there was a thing called the Duke City Shootout, game jams and kinds of events that do bring these different kinds of talents together. So that's really kind of been my interest area. It's why I got involved with Code for America and Code for Albuquerque. And one of the things that I think I find with that is you not only need partners, but you need like an interesting problem or an interesting area to explore. There are a lot of topics that we can explore given city data and given some folks who are interested in technology. But one of the things that really drove me or really interested me about this project was public art is something that I think we all have some experience with to some degree. We've seen it. We know that it's out there, but we haven't necessarily engaged with it that deeply. So I'm always looking for what can help build our wider community and bring tech and other talents together around some topic. But usually it's somebody else like Karen, the public arts program that have that topic. Sometimes in our fourth segment, we get a little more wonky on tools and techniques and practices. I know that the goal for DataFest was to possibly look at some applications for this data, but in the end, we are talking about a data set that, Karen, you administer for the public arts program. So that data set, is it actually a database that's stored where? What kind of technology is that actually? 
This is a good story, unless you're really into relational databases and collection management. Yeah, but which um, we are. <laughs> the museum system is the database, and it's this company called Gallery Systems. And the museum actually is sort of the home server. They had it first. They managed their collection. You mean the Albuquerque Museum? Yeah, the Albuquerque Museum of Art and History runs this database. They use it to manage their collection. And it's really made for museums. It's not really made for a public art program. So a lot of the relations in the database are things like outgoing loans and exhibits and stuff like that that we don't really access. And most of what the museum system records is just what happens once it becomes an object or once you acquire this thing into your institution. And so a lot of what public art is about is the commissioning of the work and making the project before it happens. So since I've been here, I've been looking at other collection management systems because we're also part of something called the Public Art Archive, which is administered through West Staff, the Western States Art Federation, and they have a public facing tool. So parts of our collection are uploaded there. And then anyone who wants to learn about public art around the country, if your collection is in there, then you can access it online. The museum uses this TMS. They have a public facing version called eMuseum, and that's how you can look up stuff in the photo archives or look up information about objects in the museum. We don't have that part. So for us, it's kind of static. The public never sees this TMS data except for now that it's in spreadsheet form. You're looking at possibly migrating that to something that's more suited to public art. Like I'm thinking in particular, like the process information about how the work was commissioned. And then I guess geolocation is probably not as big a deal for the museum world because it's in the building. Right. It's there. Exactly. For us, because the museum administers this, like if we have a new location that we need to enter into the database, someone at the museum has to enter that location for us into the database. So it's really not built for public art. Or even like we were talking about in the earlier segment, being able to track physical decay over time or monitor the physical condition of an outdoor piece, which is obviously crucial. Now there is a conservation module, so we can keep notes about conservation and we can upload documents about it in there, but it's not like I could go out in the field and access the database from my phone and enter field notes about it because there's no web component that we subscribe to. So we just have the plugged in hard server kind of version of this database. So in that sense, you can pull down this data easily, it sounds like now, because you've made it publicly accessible, but that's also not really live data. That's like a dump that you do. Yeah, we'd have to get it back. There's no way for people to directly enter back into the database, except for us. Or to access the live data in real time in that sense. Right, yeah. We did a show a few years ago about open government data. And one of the things that our guest at that time was really big on was pushing standards and open source platforms for governments to use their data so that it's not proprietary and also so that you have interoperability. So is your work with this city interoperable with your work with UNM? Well, I've been meaning to mention that the county also has a public art program and they have data too. So I want to make sure that everyone's aware that they operate their own public art program. Some of the things you see might belong to the county, but they don't talk to each other. In fact, UNM's data only exists on that New Mexico digital platform and in a few random scattered spreadsheets. And when I was doing that work, the end goal was to get it on this digital platform. As you're looking for collections management, presumably working with the museum and maybe working with the county or whoever, is there a push towards more open source or standardized approaches for collections management or is it all proprietary? We're talking about public art in Albuquerque. It's not all owned by the same entity. There's different institutions. It would do us all a lot of good if we were able to combine this data and manage it in one way. So I hope maybe that this will start that conversation, but before now, no, everyone's in their lane. Even if we use a different data collection management system for our everyday works and to help us better manage public art and the projects, we are probably still going to have to continue to keep this in this TMS system for the city, for their insurance and valuation. Everything's in one place. They could easily find all their assets in one location. It's really interesting. I didn't even think about having to track this stuff in terms of things like liability, insurance. 
It's not the part I think of as a consumer of public art, but obviously a, a sculpture could fall over on somebody and it's on city property. And some of this came up in discussion and uh, some of the conversations that uh, with Tom Johnson and Mark Leach on Saturday the 19th, where the desire is to move towards that more open, shareable direction. The challenge is that the products that were available to do the core mission, that management piece that needs to happen, that was available through proprietary software. And so making that decision of, is it better to go with this cost versus doing a standalone thing, which could have its own problems, <laughs> or to search for an open source version that may or may not exist, those are the kind of calculations that I think need to go into this. But one of the reasons why I think this was a really valuable event was there was a little bit of discussion around this and the desire to move towards something that really is much more open to public use and that they can make use of it on a regular basis. I think that's something that was clear. It seems like there's almost a niche product there. If someone could get the open source grant, I mean, I'm an open source fan, but people say sometimes to me as someone who's a developer of code, they say, well, why isn't there this product that is open source that will do X, Y, and Z? And I say, well, someone's got to pay for it. And upkeep it. Yeah, and maintain it. In the civic tech and gov tech and public interest technology world is, there have been some really great solutions that if you followed this over time, maybe there was this great open source solution that maybe after three, five years, that gets bought by somebody. That team gets absorbed by somebody else so that the free-ish version or the really interoperable version is now behind somebody else's wall. It's one of those things where since that landscape continues to evolve, even just wanting to go open source and thinking that's the right way to go, which I completely agree with, isn't always as easy as that. Because people need to make a living. I mean, (laughs) it's as simple as that. What are the next steps? Are you going to have a phase two public art? Are you going to work with different departments? Are you going to work with the Bernalillo County? I mean, where is everybody feeling they want to take this work? It feels like there's a desire to continue to do sort of this data fest, you know, whether that continues to partner with public arts program. I think that's a little bit open, but I think there was a really good meeting of minds that happened. So the desire to maybe work with public art, maybe expand from there or have some topics. I think that's on the list. I'll just say my vote is to do this at the very least on an annual basis. I think and hope that some of the products that came out of this, some of these discussions, they are turning into something that the public might see. So I'm hopeful that these different things will have a link that we can share that people can actually use. Some version of a scavenger hunt may appear at some future event. There's enough interest from enough different parties that I think we'll see a couple of pieces come out of this that the public can use, both for fun and engagement, but also maybe to work with the data itself. I was so focused on the collection management data piece (laughs) before the event that I hardly got to think about how fun this could be and what the outcomes could be. And so, yeah, part of me is like, no, we're going to do it again next year. Both of us, we're going to, you know, but also I see how public art could kind of even be a side piece to another bunch of data. Like um, somebody was there this weekend who was interested in health data and you could see sort of coming up with something that might involve walking and public art. I'd love to be part of whatever is next. And a lot of it is from that civic engagement standpoint, because I feel like that's a really important piece for public art to be part of. I'm hearing that there's also a kind of a magic that happens, not just when government people and citizens come together and listen to each other, but also when citizens come together and discover that they're all engaged around similar values. These events kind of build their own momentum over time. Yeah, it's sort of this emergent property from these kinds of activities, I think, is we think there's a there there. And in some ways, you know, maybe that doesn't happen. But I think what we heard from the folks in the room and the different people around these tables was that there really are a lot of different directions to go. I love the way you described it, Ellen. Thank you. Thank you both so much for being with us today. Thank you. So fun. Really, really been a total pleasure. It's been great working with Karen and the rest of the folks on the team as well. So thanks for giving us an opportunity to share a little bit more about this. And if you would like more information about the DataFest ArtQuest, you can visit cabq.gov slash DataFest. And if you want to look at the current public art data, you can go to cabq.gov slash abq hyphen data. Augmented Humanity is a program of the New Mexico Humanities Council produced in partnership with KUNM-FM. You can visit us online and find out more about our programs at nmhumanities.org. Our theme music comes courtesy James Whiten, and we've had production assistance from Tristan Klum.